A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on May 20th, 2020. I'm Anna Garcia. And as you can see, we are still following the safer at home guidelines, which are a requirement here in the state of California. Our guest this week is former Burbank Police Lieutenant Eric Rossoff, who was on the force for 31 years specialized in robbery homicide, which will be very helpful today in the two cases that we're going to look at. And he also runs the Campus Safety Group, which specializes in school safety. Eric, welcome to the program. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for having me, and I really appreciate it. Um, tell me just a little bit about your background and your expertise in all of those years in law enforcement. Uh, certainly. Um, I was proud to serve for the Burbank Police Department for 31 years, and I uh, had the good fortune to work in various assignments, very interesting assignments. Uh, Burbank, as you know, is a relatively small enclave in the middle of Los Angeles County, but uh, you get a good look at a pretty good uh, cross-section of everything that is Los Angeles, the greater Los Angeles area. Um, I worked in patrol. I had an assignment in um, what we call our robbery homicide division. I actually have the distinction of being one of the Burbank Police Department's first ever gang investigators. Uh, as a sergeant, I had a chance to continue my expertise in gangs, and also it, I was in charge of a surveillance unit and it was, for all intents and purposes, a, a fugitive apprehension team. Uh, and then later in my career, I was able to promote to lieutenant where um, I was uh, kind of transitioned into an administrative position and spent several years working in internal affairs. And I know that homicide was a big part of that, even though Burbank is a small place. I know I've covered murders there and shootings. So um, let's get to our cases today. We have two cases this week. A man and his ex-wife have been charged for the murder of his ex-girlfriend who has been missing since 2019. But first, a prominent doctor in Massachusetts has been charged with killing his wife after her body was found in a pond. Eric, our first case is a Massachusetts surgeon who has been arrested and charged with murdering his wife of just five months. Her body was found in a pond near their home. This was a fast-moving case last week that really occurred over just a few days. So we're going to examine those few days of activity and then, Eric, do a deep dive into the background of this couple. So on Thursday, May 14th, Kathleen McLean disappears. She was at home with her husband, Dr. Ingolf Turk. Now here's what's interesting. So she was last seen at home with her husband, but he doesn't call 911 to report her missing until the next day. Is that bizarre? Uh, by itself, uh, you would think that the uh, who would report someone missing generally would be the folks that are most likely to notice their absence, right? Which, uh, as an investigator or even you know frontline police officer responding in, you might think to yourself that would be an obvious question to ask. Why haven't you called till now? You know, when did you first notice her missing? And you start to put the pieces together. You know, if it's a story like, oh well, she said she was going to the store, and then I just never saw her you would think, okay, the next thing the officer does is look for the cars. You know, well, wait, her car is here, but you said she was going to the store, those types of things. So, um, you know, every piece just leads to the next piece of information. So on its face, not incredibly, you know, suspicious, but as you start to build the rest of the case, you can see how it falls back on top of each other. So she's reported missing on the 15th, which would be Friday. So in the middle of all this, the husband sends a text message to a mutual friend of the couple. Now, while the husband's name is Ingolf, he also goes by the nickname of Harry. So this is the text message that the husband sends. Kurt, I'm sorry, brother, but she is a vindictive devil. She played us all. I'm really sorry, brother, but she manipulated us all. Love you, Harry. Now, what do you make of that? Is that, that telling early on in the investigation? Yes, if you had access to that uh, um, text message early in the in the investigation, it's kind of setting up a couple of things, you know, because it, it it's 
counterintuitive to someone that would call and say, hey, there's someone I love that's missing, right? That's what their motivation for calling in the first place. And now I'm seeing this text message that's referring to that same person as a vindictive person who played us all. Um, taking it a little bit deeper, maybe to an investigative mode, it would be, am I, uh, you know, am I sorry for something that I've done? Am I justifying something that I might have done? You know, so what are my friends going to think about me when or if they find out about this event? So it, it, it just doesn't, you know, fit into why I'm originally calling the police department to, uh, to uh, report this missing person. You would think any subsequent text message would be, oh, my God, I don't know where she is. I'm so worried. Anything exactly. other than that, you start, the flags start to go up. It's almost as if he is setting her up as the problem. If there is a problem and she is missing, it is her own fault, not him, because she's the devil, as right. he called her. It's exactly right. So a little bit about the couple here. So Kathleen was 45 years old and had three children. She ran an energy and healing business, something we could all use these days. <laughs> um, she and Ingolf married last December. However, the two of them have been together as a couple for two years, they lived in a sprawling home. He was incredibly successful, and he was the father of two teenage boys. She, the mother of three, so they had a blended family. Now, even though the marriage was really short, just five months, there was a lot of history of domestic abuse. So, again, let's go over these four days from her disappearance until her body is found, because that plays out from Thursday to Sunday, which is really pretty quick, I think, because. Uh, uh, in a missing person's murder case. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen disappears on Thursday. By Saturday night, her husband was found in a local motel, unresponsive. He had to be revived with the drug Narcan, which is often used for people who have OD'd on, on opioids. So he gets taken to the hospital, and while he's in the hospital, he allegedly confesses to the police that he killed her. He said that he was strangling her, he was choking her, but he wasn't trying to kill her. And when he realized that he had killed Kathleen, he grabs her body and dumps her in a nearby pond. Now, he was worried at this point that she might float up. So she, he tells police that he used some rocks to hold her down. And in fact, when they finally did find her body, she had rocks in her pocket. So by 11 o'clock Saturday night, Police have found Kathleen's body in the pond, and by Sunday, Ingolf is charged with her murder. What do you make of this? Yeah, it, you can, as you see the end, you get to the end of the story. Now you can reconstruct it, and it does seem like, um, you know, the pieces fit in. Now we can go back to that text message, let's say, and remember what he says at the end of the text message, I'm sorry. And then you put the I'm sorry together with now the next thing that we know about uh, about him is that he's in a motel room uh, uh, with all the evidence that at least we have available to us, uh, uh, possibly has injected some type of an opiate to the point of uh, being unresponsive and needing Narcan. I think I even read in the story too something about some superficial lacerations, you know, consistent with trying to cut, you know, to slit his wrists and such. So uh, then it all comes together at this point. And even with his subsequent confession and series of events, then you get into a heat of passion uh, type of a, of, a, um, of a homicide. That, uh, you know, the way that it breaks down would suggest that it wasn't so much a premeditated act as much as uh, an aggressive act and then clumsy attempts to cover it up. And frankly, if this guy is a renowned surgeon or really just any doctor, if he wanted to kill himself, he could have. Yeah, I would like to get a little bit more information about what brought the uh, police department and or fire department to the motel. Um, if it's, uh, you know, cleaning crew or whatever it might be that brings them, brings them to the motel. Because generally speaking, you know, Narcan is that last thing between life and death. Yeah. And uh, he would know that too, if I'm in whatever it may be that we're, there's a lot of supposition here, but we can certainly connect the dots that he injected himself with something, you know, uh, trying to kill himself. And as a doctor, you would assume that he would know what that dose would be that would be necessary to kill himself. Now, if he was the one that called the police department or the fire department 
it wasn't much of an attempt to kill himself. He wasn't that committed to that. If it was someone else and it was more of like a circumstance or, you know, coincidence that they arrived with Narcan, uh, maybe he really was trying to kill himself and was at, at the end of the day remorseful for what he had done. Uh, clearly, he had a lot of problems that we're going to get into and financial problems. His career was on the skids. His marriage clearly um, in trouble because one of the things that we're going to talk about is how um, she wanted a divorce. So he was definitely desperate, definitely desperate. I just find it, you know, very um, troubling that he is capable of murdering one person, but when it comes to himself, that's why I think it was more of a, an act of desperation. Uh, I'm not trying to be judgmental here, but, you know, one woman is dead. So, um, you know, the, the police always thought that Dr. Ingolf Turk was a prime suspect from the very beginning because of all the domestic violence. So let's get into the characters here because he's really unusual. He was almost like a celebrity surgeon in the Massachusetts area. Um, he was a specialist in robotics. Um, he was the um, head of urology at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. He was well-known and sought after. And he was a really big guy. And he was kind of flamboyant in a way. He was six foot three, really strong, athletic build, good looking guy. He was a former Olympic athlete. He was a member of the East German Olympic decathlon, decathlon team in 1980, but he quit to go to medical school. So um, what's interesting is he used to ride his Harley Davidson to the hospital and play rock music in the operating room. And the hospital that he worked for made a videotape, like a promotional videotape about him. And it really shows his character. And we're going to play a clip of that now. Dr. Ingolf Turk is not your typical surgeon. At six foot three with an athletic physique, it's easy to see why he was once a member of the German Olympic decathlon team. Surgery is physical, very demanding work for hours. Uh, you are physically involved in a surgery, uh, and that requires that you're physically fit as a surgeon. Well, Dr. Turk, even though he was considered a prominent surgeon, was having some serious problems with his career and with um, finances. So his career came to a screeching halt in February when he was formally terminated, but apparently the hospital said for a year prior to that, he was not seeing patients because he was under investigation by the Massachusetts Attorney General for allegedly fraudulently billing Medicaid, either for surgeries that didn't occur or patient visits that didn't happen. Ultimately, in November of 2019, he agreed to pay a $150,000 fine to resolve this case. But as part of it, he was told that he was either going to have to relinquish his medical license or they were going to take it away. So this is the background of what is going on with him in his life. Losing his job, criminal investigation, has to pay a fine. So that's an awful lot of stress. And at the same time, it appears based on police records, Eric, that this is, that, that the violence is escalating at this time that he's under so much stress. Yeah. And it's a pattern that is predictable. And it's, um, you know, what catches everybody's eye, the public persona, right, is that uh, a flamboyant motorcycle riding, you know, a renowned surgeon, bigger than life personality. Uh, and we always don't see behind the, the curtain, right? And that's what you count on law enforcement to do is get beyond the facade of who the person is and dig into, okay, what's really happening? What's on the other side of the camera that's really going on? And, uh, and the, those keys, again, are relatively well established that you would see domestic violence certainly is, a, a, you know, if not the number one, uh, an indicator. And then you start to look at other stressors as it relates to the occurrences of domestic violence. And you can generally see, and the more the stressor, you know, losing my job, uh, you know, I was a bigger than life personality that's now going to be exposed as someone that has cheated the system. And so that fall is pretty dramatic. And the domestic violence starts to go up to a, a higher level. And now there's someone missing. Um, it's, it's a very predictable pattern. And what you hope, at least at the initial response to a missing person 
type of a case that the law enforcement agency would be, oh no, it's doctor, you know, whatever. There, it, it, it must just be a missing person because he's such a great guy. And we don't, we, you know, we hope that law enforcement's response is, I don't know who you are. And I'm just going to look at facts related to what, what's in front of me. Because yeah, but- we've, we have cases, right, that here in Los Angeles County, where the bigger than life, you know, individual uh, with domestic violence, and then there's a murder, you know, type of a thing where you start to find out about law enforcement looking the other way for some of the domestic violence issues because the person was a larger than life celebrity. So, you know, we've learned those lessons, hopefully, and uh, we, we pay attention to what's exactly in front of us, not what's on the other side of the camera. The documented domestic violence goes back to early December of 2019. So what's interesting is that this is the same month that they, they got married in Las Vegas, you know, so it's just, you always have to wonder, it's like, it was pretty clear that this guy was violent, yet they go ahead and they get married. So in early December, Kathleen said that she had been in bed and she got into some kind of an argument with Ingolf and that during the fight, she told police that he slammed her head into the headboard and used one hand to strangle her and one hand to cover her nose and mouth until she started going black. And she told the police that she thought for sure that she was going to die. She apparently screamed and one of the kids heard her. And then on December 14th, a week or two later, they get married in Las Vegas. When we look at these things, again, from the end game, looking backwards, but uh, there is a victimology, you know, in domestic violence that's undeniable. Um, And, you know, certainly nothing for you or me or anybody else to judge. Uh, But the unfortunate reality is... um, uh, uh, not, you know, people that are the victims of domestic violence uh, frequently will look for those other redeeming qualities in the abuser that will then overcome the, the fact that there's abuse. Like it's going to get better. They said that they were sorry. It, you know, so I believe them so much. And, you know, whatever those connections might be, there was enough that got over the worry of the domestic violence. And then we're, you know, we're getting, we're getting married. And the unfortunate, you know, and as we know, uh, uh, those situations are never going to end well. No, it doesn't improve. The domestic violence does not go away, no. not magically because of a wedding ceremony. Now, in January, so they've just been married a few weeks. In January, there are two incidents. Kathleen told police that her husband picked her up and threw her to the ground during an argument. He threw her down with such force that her shoes went flying across the room. And even in the middle of this horrible attack, he was telling Kathleen that he loved her. And and that's part of the whole abusive pattern. I'm beating the crap out of you, but I do love you. I love you. So Kathleen also told police about another incident. Uh, Apparently, and this is really weird, he picked up a pair of scissors and he told his wife, I'm the king of this castle and you are only a guest. And then he cut off some of her hair. Yeah, it's uh, a possession. Uh, you know, what it, uh, the psychology behind that is you're a possession of mine and I can take anything from you that I want to take from you. And there's nothing that you can do about it. Um, you know, it, it's horrible and it's, you know, um, uh, disgusting. But that's part of the psychology of it is that you at the end this moment, all you are to me is a possession and you need to understand that. And I'm going to make you ugly. Because they're both very attractive. The couple is a very good looking couple, but he is clearly going to make her ugly and she is a beautiful woman. Apparently, one of the kids also heard or witnessed this. Right. So then Kathleen, this is all part of um, a workup, if you will, with the police to prepare for a restraining order. Kathleen told the police that he would track her location using her iPhone and that he would call everyone in her contact list to ask them if they had just seen her. And you see that a lot, that kind of um, paranoia, that control and that possession in the middle of, um, of one of these, you know, violent relationships. Uh, absolutely. Then there are two, uh, two components to that. One is, I know that she might start to tell somebody about what's happening and I don't want that to happen. And the other is, she's setting up an escape plan. You know, she's going to these different people and I want her and I also want those people to understand that you know, I'm involved, that if she comes and lives with you, let's say, I know where you are. 
and I know what's going on. You know, the language that might be going on isn't exactly that. You know, you better not help her. But the language, the 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 motivation for the phone call is just to let all those people know I know who you are and I know where you live and I have your phone number. Exactly. And she's not leaving me, right? Yeah. No matter what. He gets interviewed by the police and he tells the Dover police that there really was no physical violence. He denied it entirely. He claimed that you know, it's possible that he touched her one time, one time, but he said that was because she tried to take his cell phone away. It was her fault and he was defending himself. So by February 3rd, she finally files for a restraining order. Kathleen told the Dover police that she was being abused and that she wanted a divorce. She said that her husband had lost his job, was sitting around the house all day, and he was very angry. So you can imagine he's quite bitter at this point. You know, everything that he's worked for is collapsing. Of course, one would make the argument it is all his fault because if you were not allegedly fraudulently billing the state for medical procedures that didn't happen, you would not be in this mess to begin with, right? You wouldn't be losing your job. Yes, and you go back to uh, him as a young man, right? As uh, Eastern Bloc uh, Olympian, um, I'm guessing, you know, I have no frame of reference of understanding it, but he has probably been relatively entitled for quite some time and everybody loved him and he was given things and he was lauded and he was appreciated and that manifests itself. He becomes a doctor and he's a renowned doctor and all, and all of a sudden all of that is deflating, you know, the, the, the ship is sinking and it's sinking rapidly. You know, his and world is, is his world's, uh, you know, falling in on top of him. And Kathleen did tell the police that she was afraid of, of his reaction to her wanting a divorce. So right. she already knew that this was going to be a problem. It's interesting. She shared this with several friends and two of them were, are also police officers um, a friend told the Boston Globe that he had become very despondent about the loss of his career and that he was drinking a lot. This may bring into play whether he was, um, you know, numbing himself, medicating himself uh, with drugs and alcohol. That's a possibility given that he had to be revived um, at the motel. So police serve the restraining order on the husband and they confiscate several weapons and ammunition. Um, he handed over his license to carry firearms and he apparently did not take the news well about the restraining order. So something happens here, Eric, because by the beginning of May, the beginning of this month, the two reconciled. She moves back into the house and not just that, she asked the court to drop the restraining order, she said because they were committed to couples counseling, Ingoff was going to go to his own individual counseling, and this is what she wrote in the affidavit. I feel safe. I feel safe and would like to bring my family back together with my husband. My goal is to salvage our family, including reuniting with my husband as father and stepfather to my children. And a few weeks later, she's dead. Um, the uh, person that's been established or uh, as a victim of domestic violence, probably in at least in now there's court intervention, right? There's a, there's a court uh, paper that says we have this restraining order. You would like to think that in a perfect world, it would no longer be the, the victim of domestic violence. That would be the last determining factor of safety that there would be some sort of maybe incremental implementation to reconciliation, uh, you know, because again, remember the victim cycle is something bad really happened and then there is some type of reconciliation. I feel like it's never going to, I bought into it. It's never going to happen again. We know that that doesn't have, that that hardly ever ends well. So what you would like to think is it's not just an immediate, the victim coming in saying, never mind, I want to go back to the house. Once there's that intervention, there should be additional steps. We're, we're just, as society, we're not at that point to, to uh, have that additional safety net that's put into place. So despite the doctor reportedly confessing to killing the wife to police and leading police to her body, he has entered a plea of not guilty and he is being held without bail and he is expected back in court on June 10th. I'm curious though, Eric, if he, let's just say that he did confess 
and he did tell police where the body was. And then he enters a plea of not guilty. How does this play out? It's the right thing for a defense attorney to do to recommend a plea of not guilty uh, because it opens up uh, uh, many possible defenses and not the least of which the uh, defense attorney has the obligation to research everything that law enforcement has done and run it through the, the tests of propriety. You know, was the confession obtained lawfully? Um, it, are there other um, uh, potential levels of homicide here that would be more appropriate and even dispositions and punishments that would be most appropriate? So the not guilty plea just kind of opens that. It, it keeps the dialogue going and it gives the defense team an opportunity to, as they should, to go through everything that's been done to this point to make sure that it, uh, it meets evidentiary um, uh, standards. Our next case is out of North Carolina, where a mother of two who is still missing, but she is presumed dead. There are now two people who have been charged with her murder. 23-year-old Monica Moynan, who may have been pregnant at the time of her murder, was reported missing in July of 2019. Police believe that she may have been pregnant, and that may be one of the reasons that she may have been killed. So, Brian Sluss is the father of her two children and her ex-boyfriend. He has been charged with her murder, and he is believed to be the last person to have seen her alive. Jarlyn Sluss is Brian's ex-wife, okay, ex-wife of the ex. I know it gets very confusing here. She's been charged with obstruction of justice and an accessory after the fact because she somehow was a part, at least in the back end of this cover-up. So let's get into some of the facts here because I know it's really confusing. We have a mom of two who's missing, believed murdered. The two people who are charged with murdering her are her ex-boyfriend, baby daddy, and his ex-wife. Already it's like Peyton Place here. Police say that for months after she disappeared, her ex-boyfriend, Brian, texted friends and her family using her phone. So it made it appear that she was alive, right? She's responding to people. She's posting on social media. So for a while there, it appears that Monica is alive. But it was Monica's mother who found it very strange because she had not spoken with her daughter and that was unusual so it was monica's mother who called the police and said look you need to do a welfare check because this is really bizarre i'm sure something is wrong and that's when the case in earnest starts unfolding um police say that monica was finally reported back in july of 2019 but they believe that really she was missing since april so eric what do you make of this how does the cell phone fit into into things and, and what was going on here with the ex Brian? Yeah, it's a, this is actually a pretty fascinating case. And, uh, you know, anytime we're talking about a murder prosecution, a murder investigation without the body, um, there are um, uh, incredibly high thresholds to arrive at investigatively and also in prosecution. Um, you know, one of the things you think about going to court is if you're going to do a murder prosecution, uh, the jury is going to expect that there's a body and there's some forensic examination of that body that indicates it was uh, um, it was a homicide. So to uh, to start out with, um, the FBI actually has a, um, a whole behavioral science unit that's based on um, uh, putting together cases and prosecuting cases without a body. And what they refer to is the victim's footprint. <clears throat> Excuse me, and what this case offers us, right, is you can start to see some of the maybe investigative hesitance because there's still part of a footprint there. You know, the footprint relating to the impression that the victim, the missing person, is leaving in the world. Uh, there's two parts of that. There's the physical one. That's the mother saying, I'm not hearing from her, and I always hear from her. The other is the electronic footprint. And the electronic footprint, we, we kind of had that because... Uh, theoretically, the way the case looks like it's being put together, it was actually the suspect, you know, her, her ex and his ex-wife that were using her, her cell phone to put out social media to make that, to generate that electronic footprint. 
So as we get deeper into the case, I think we start to see how uh, other information starts to come together that leads us to get beyond those thresholds to open the investigation, to make it an arrest, and then finally, you know, to arrive at uh, prosecution. And wasn't Brian using Monica's car? Didn't he have her car? He had her car, but he had uh, what may have at first glance been a reasonable uh, a reason for having the car in that he said his car was broken down and she had given her car to him so he could drive the kids around. And so, uh, again, at the, at the boots on the ground responding out to this, that's not unreasonable. It's a piece of information that I have, but it's not unreasonable. And it starts to think, what were you know, Monica's resources to disappear from the world without her car? You know, if, uh, and you would start to put that, to, could, to, could she afford to buy a, a plane ticket or a bus ticket? Because you know, then we would go to those places like the bus station or you know, uh, Annie, we would check, you know, every airline, we can do that relatively easily to see if she shows up on a manifest someplace. They found some interesting things, the police. So um, there were search warrants that were finally issued in October, and that they reveal that investigators found a positive pregnancy test in Monica's home. That's why they believe that she was pregnant. That's why they believe that that could have had something to do with it because it seems like the most recent incident or event. Yeah, as you start to put together the timeline, absolutely. When was the last time anyone other than the suspect had any interaction with her? And one of those things we can tell that she was alive at this moment <laughs> because there's this test and the test was positive. Um, how that then later generates into potential motive um, you know, you can start to, again, you can start to put those pieces together. Police also say that Brian kept changing his story about where Monica was since, remember, he was the last person to see her alive and they have children together. He told police that she was addicted to cocaine and had run away. Then he told police that she was in a drug treatment center. But of course, he couldn't tell them which one, and nonetheless, they didn't find her at any drug treatment center. So here's the background, the deep dive. At the time of Monica's disappearance, she had a protective order against Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's that, that cycle of abuse. You know, the first and foremost, you get out to a missing person uh, case and you would, uh, are, you know, what's the background of those, that person? And literally, you know, in local law enforcement at your fingertips, you would be able to find out that the person that's missing has been the victim of, a, of domestic violence. Now we're focusing in on, let's go back and find that person that was allegedly involved in the domestic violence. It's a well, pretty, it's it, one leads directly to the other. Well, here's the problem with part of his story about the car. If he says, oh, she lent me the car because I needed it. Well, excuse me, she's got a restraining order against you. Why in the world would she ever help you with a car? You're exactly right. And then but you, as you can see it unfold, you know, as, as the officers are responding out, they say, yeah, she's got a restraining order, but they also have kids. So she might be looking at it. Now, not to saying that this is what happened, obviously, but at least at that first glance, it's unusual, but it's not like suspect by itself, because you can rationalize how the, the mother of children might give her ex, you know, the car, even though he's a domestic abuser, so their kids can be more comfortable getting around town. So let's talk about... Brian's ex-wife, Jarlyn, who is also charged, charged as an accessory here. She told police that her ex-husband called her the day that Monica is believed to have been killed, the last time she was seen alive. She claimed that he was in an emotional state, that he talked about what his kids should receive as if he's discussing his estate after he's gone, as if something is going to happen to him. Police say then Brian went to Jarlin's house several times, and they find this interesting. Brian apparently lied to police saying that, you know, when they said, where were you? Brian apparently told police that he was on his way to his parents' house when he was actually at Jarlin's house, the ex-wife, because they tracked his GPS, and clearly he was not in a different state or in a different location. He was at the ex's. Jarlin, the ex-wife, told police that he asked her to call Monica's apartment manager and pretend to be Monica. 
Now, why would you need to do that unless something terrible has happened to that person? It's almost, and probably the apartment manager would not really recognize Monica's voice. So Jarlin probably, you know, could have pulled it off pretending to be her. But of course, she could not fool Monica's family or mother. No way. And then there were a lot of phone calls that went back and forth between Brian and his ex, Jarlin. So when that search warrant was finally executed at Jarlin's house in August of 2019, she told police that she had a copy of a driver's license belonging to Monica and some of her personal photos. Why would the ex-wife, unless she's a stalker, have these things? Right. And you, you can see how this plays out, right? As the officers are now focusing in on what was taking place. And remember, I talked earlier about that electronic footprint of the victim. There's also an electronic footprint of potential suspects and using GPS, uh, you know, capabilities, they were able, you know, they talk to him and they get, you know, they, they ask him a question and then they find out that his answer is a lie. And so why would you lie to me about that? Because he's not on his way to his parents. He's at his ex-wife's house. Um, which leads again to get to that threshold that now I believe a crime really has been committed here and they have to convince a judge, right? I need to go into the ex-wife's house because I believe that there might be evidence of a crime there. That's not an easy threshold to get to, but with their, all the pieces coming together, a judge did sign a search warrant. And what do they find in the ex-wife's house? Information that would suggest that she might have been complicit in a crime. And number one, that a crime committed and she could be complicit in it. So as you start to look at, um, you know, as they're building a case, everywhere they're going, the, lo the law enforcement agency and everything they're doing is within the boundaries of reasonableness and supporting this theory that uh, first the ex, the, the ex boyfriend and now his ex wife are involved in a murder. But we're still at that point where we don't have a body. You know, this is not an easy case by any stretch of the imagination. No, and the restraining order apparently says that Monica thought she was going to die because Brian had choked her. And even though she had this restraining order, she still permitted the father to visit the children. Um, and it's really unclear what was the nature of the relationship between Monica and Brian, because again, there's this pregnancy test. So is she pregnant with his baby? Are they kind of getting back together or... What's going on here? When uh, there's a couple of different ways, and this again, you know, we're left on our side of this with some speculation, and we we don't have all the information that the police department does, but we can actually come to a couple of different potential conclusions. One was it was obviously they just didn't like each other at all, but there was some type of uh, custodial agreement that said that he got to um, visit the children. Now it could be that he was still in love with her. And, you know, she was trying to get away from him and that's you know, because of the domestic violence. And maybe she told him I'm pregnant and he knew it wasn't his baby. You know, maybe that's one of the motivations for what could have been violence. It could be that he doesn't want anything to do with her and she was still madly in love with him. And she says, I'm pregnant with your baby. And that could be, you know, that tipping point. Uh, the fact that the pregnancy test is uh, something that the uh, uh, based on what we're reading, the police department used probably in obtaining additional search warrants. Uh, I would, uh, knowing what I know and having been involved in similar investigations, there's some other information that they believe that that pregnancy test was a, a sparking moment that one way or another, like I'm so mad at you because you're having somebody else's baby, you know, or uh, I'm, I'm, you're really messing up my whole plan because you're having my baby. Right. And we don't know yet because obviously Monica hasn't been found. Her body's not been found. So obviously once she is, an autopsy might be able to explain her the level of pregnancy and perhaps some DNA information that would tell us who the father was. Right. I'm not 100% sure that that information is not available off the pregnancy test, um, depending on what type of pregnancy test it was. Um, but you know, uh, with the technology that is available, they may be able to determine just even from that test, you know, how those tests are, you know, how you take that test, depending on what type it is. It's possible that uh, there could be DNA evidence that links Brian directly to the pregnancy or someone else. Right. So we've got to talk about the kids here because um, Brian and Monica had two children, and he's behind bars. She's missing and presumed dead. So 
apparently once Monica was declared officially missing, she, Monica's mother, the children's grandparents, um, applied to have custody of the kids. And that's where they are now with the, with Monica's mother. So they are safe. And that's, you know, because you have to think about them. They're, they're the ultimate victims here as well, because their mother has gone presumed murder and their father is charged with killing their mother. Yeah, I've been uh, personally involved in, I was, as I was reading this case, I was kind of going back through my case law and I've been personally involved in three of these types of cases where the father killed the mother and there were children involved. And in one of those cases, having to actually tell the children that the mother was dead and the father and the father's in custody. Um, I, uh, you know, I get Terry thinking about that now and I can't imagine what that does, you know, to the, the children listening to that and someone that they don't know at all, you know, that's giving them this information and how that, you know, impacts the rest of their life. You know, you, uh, I, I, I just, uh, you know, as many victims as we run into, you know, with violence and such, uh, perhaps, you know, the, the, the most vulnerable of all that is when there's children involved. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how children recover from that. And, and the only antidote to um, evil and pain and suffering is love and compassion. And hopefully that they are surrounded with a lot of support, a lot of therapy and professionals assisting them to get through this. And, and, you know, I, I am also a big believer that you need to tell the kids when it's appropriate at the right time, the truth, because that will help them process what really happened. Um, how can yeah. you shield them at this point? Yeah. And there are experts, you know, at a level of, you know, a pay grade that goes well beyond mine about, um, when and where to share, you know, what and how, uh, you know, at various levels. And I'm sure there's variables about the child's ability to absorb and understand that information. So here's where the two people charged stand. On May 5th, Brian was arrested in Virginia at his parents' house. He's been charged with murder and he has waived his right to extradition. He's being held without bond. His ex-wife, Jarlyn, was arrested on May 12th. She was charged with accessory after the fact. She was arrested at her home and she is being held on $750,000 bail. Both have pleaded innocent and Monica is still missing. Yeah, that's going to be the key here is, um, you know, as we know, uh, you know, this, the way the court system is designed, right, is both of these folks are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. So, uh, again, we get to that threshold about uh, the prosecutors. Now, the investigators, they had to reach certain thresholds to gather enough information to be able to put, put a case in front of the prosecutors. Now, the prosecutors have filed charges and, and made arrests, and now they've got to get over the threshold of beyond a reasonable doubt, you know, uh, uh, convincing 12, a jury of their peers, that they committed this crime without a body. And that still is incredibly difficult. So, you know, put yourself in the position, I'm a juror and I'm listening to this information. Do I believe that the person is dead? Have they got there? And then if I do believe the person is dead, has the prosecutor given me enough information to believe that these two people are responsible either directly or after the fact in that murder? And uh, it'll be a fascinating case to see how it plays out. Um, you know, the, the motivation is going to be a very big thing. I think, although we haven't seen all of it, the depth of that pregnancy test, I think that's going to end up being a key issue in the establishing a motive. The domestic violence, the previous domestic violence certainly uh, goes a long way with a jury as a pattern of behavior. And I think one of the things about uh, a case without a body is there's no way for a juror to sit in a, in a jury box like that without thinking, what if I was to disappear tomorrow? You know, what is my footprint? And, you know, what would, what would be, you know, would people come looking for me? And would they notice that? And, you know, we all kind of think, boy, if I did all of a sudden just fell off the face of the earth, um, would the police and others be advocating for me, you know, really looking for me? And if something bad happened, would they really be hunting down the person that did it? Uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility that the juror would be thinking, uh, you know, what if this happened to me? And then they can right away put themselves in Monica's shoes. 
and say, did this happen to Monica? It's time for our comment section. These are the stories which uh, so many of our listeners and followers are really talking about. So this is about a holdup at a gas station in Virginia. And the two suspects walk into this convenience store gas station in Louisa, Virginia, and they are wearing watermelons. I mean, the whole watermelon and then little, you know, slits for eyes. And I mean, it almost looks like they're like part of a crazy avant-garde band. <laughs> they're walking around with giant watermelon heads. Um, and in fact, that is the nickname that the cops gave them, the melon heads. Police posted the surveillance photos of the suspects and their unusual disguises. Um, the Louisa Police Department also put up a picture of the truck that they were driving. Um, the two suspects pulled up in a pickup truck and they stole from the Sheets gas station at 9.35 p.m. on Wednesday, May 6th. Um, and what a surprise. They made an arrest despite this incredible disguise. <laughs> And I honestly don't know where to take you on this case other than to say um, it's, you know, at any given moment when someone gets to a point that they are desperate or otherwise and think that they're formulating a criminal act and they get together and they literally put their heads or rinds together, depending on what it might be and say, how are we going to do this? We should somehow or another hide our identity. I guarantee that every police officer anywhere in the country that has read this case, every police department has a caricaturist, the cartoonist of the agency that you know is pretty prolific about picking up on stuff like this. I guarantee there are little cartoons around police stations of like a, a police lineup with like a pumpkin and uh, you know and a watermelon and you know going across a squash the, whatever it may be that uh, eventually we are probably going to apprehend that criminal and could you imagine the louisa police department that going unsolved you would feel pretty bad about that so there you know those are the types of ones don't let these guys get away because they're only going to hurt themselves or somebody else down the line if this was the best that they could come up with in formulating this plan to commit a crime well, there has been an arrest, so you can you can rest peacefully now about that. And here are some of the comments. Uh, Renee S. writes, gross, bugs and everything flying around. Ew. And Jeffrey A. writes, these suspects weren't using their melons. No, I do not think so. All right. This next case is very interesting, and I want to hear about your personal experiences with this. Not that you did this, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah, clear that up a little bit, please. <laughs> okay, all right. So the Fayetteville um, police have arrested one of their employees after she was found stealing marijuana from the evidence locker. An employee of the Fayetteville Police Department's evidence division has been fired after stealing marijuana that had been confiscated as evidence. Megan Churchill she worked in the department and she decided to go to the facility during off hours. Now, that's usually a key is like, ding, 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 ding. What are you doing in here? Not during working hours. What are you doing? So it turns out an, an internal investigation revealed that she took marijuana that was scheduled for destruction. So she probably figured her timing was really good. Nobody's going to miss it anyway. It's just going to be destroyed. And nonetheless... They arrested her, but they were unable to figure out how much she took because I guess they didn't know how much was scheduled for destruction, which leads me to believe I think they need to do a little bit better bookkeeping, just just an idea, suggestion there. So you say that this is uh, a pretty common crime? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, theft from a property room is probably the number one reason that a police employee is uh, terminated and or prosecuted. Um, my, uh, uh, when I took the administrative position as a lieutenant uh, in internal affairs, I was actually responsible for the oversight of our property room. The, um, the good news for me is the internationally uh, recognized expert on property rooms and property room maintenance is a former Burbank police lieutenant. He's actually uh, has a company uh, related to uh, property rooms and established a, uh, there's an international association of property and evidence that he does all the training for. And what this all comes down to is, uh, you know, it's opportunity. That uh, the three things that are the most likely things to walk out of property rooms are narcotics, uh, firearms, and money. So uh, he put in um, and continues to develop these incredibly 
um, uh, uh, big walls between and over, uh, uh, redundant systems of oversight between those three things and the people that work in, in our agencies. You know, for example, once every couple of months uh, as a lieutenant for the police department, I would randomly have to go down to the um, property room and conduct an audit of either money, drugs, or firearms. So everybody that worked in that narcotics room knew that there was going to be independent oversight no more than two, two months away. Um, we, uh, uh, here in California, most agencies in disposing narcotics will do what's called a narcotic burn. And uh, we'll go to one of the uh, many uh, uh, places in, uh, located across California. Uh, sometimes it's places that actually do like cremations. And others, it's places that, uh, like in, in Long Beach, California, there's a uh, place where they burn, uh, within California standards, they'll burn uh, trash. And uh, the, the, the layers that we have to go through to pull, that, pull the narcotics off that are due to be destroyed, how many different people in the agency have to be there and sign off that what we're taking to the place is, you know, actually gets to the place. It's because the system was designed knowing that if we don't watch these things, we have some, unfortunately, people with malice that are thinking about stealing it. And then, unfortunately, we have some people that, based on an addiction or just opportunity, might think, hey, it'll be easy for me to take something. So we're trying to eliminate both of those things. But uh, until, I, until I became in charge of the property room, I, have, I had zero uh, understanding that this is the number one thing that will cause a police, a police employee to get fired and prosecuted is the property room. Well, these are the comments from our viewers and readers. Sade or Sadie, forgive me, I don't know how you pronounce your name. Sadie G writes, she was just stressed out and needed to puff a little. And Ruth Ann F writes, sounds like someone watched the movie Half Baked too many times. All right, well, that is our show for today. Eric, thank you so much for joining us and walking us through these two cases. If people want to follow you or get in touch with you, where can they find you? Uh, CampusSafetyGroup.com. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to say that. And it was a pleasure being here with you, Anna. Thank you so much, Eric. We really appreciate your insight today. As always, you can find our content on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. And of course, on YouTube, you can get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>